Oh wait, Lorenzo, you're on mute. <laughs> Always the same mistake. <laughs> so <laughs> welcome back everyone and a warm, we warm welcome to Professor Sue Rottingheimer. Professor um, Rockingame uh, is, uh, uh, comes from the Department of Comparative Literature and Cultural Studies at Stony Brook uh, University, State University of New York, and is a leading American scholar of the Grimm's fairy tales. Her recent publications include Fairy Tale, A New History, 2009, Gender and History in South India, edited with Lalita Handu and Lila uh, Prasad in 2007, and Fairy Godmother, Straparola, Venice, and Fairy Tale Tradition, 2002. Past publications include the Bible for Children, From the Age of Gutenberg to the Present, 1996, Grimm's Bad Girls and Bold Boys, The Moral and Social Vision of the Tales, 1987, and Fairy Tales and Society, Illusion, Allusion and Paradigm, um, 18, 1987. Apart from these, she has written numerous articles and chapters in books on diverse topics, including European fairy tales, the history of illustration, and the socialization of children through Bible narratives. She has also published reviews, encyclopedia articles and translations, and the languages of research have included English, German, French, and Italian. So it is uh, an honor to have you here, Professor um, Bottinghain, and uh, um, we, we we really look forward to your paper, which is entitled Basile and Greek Mythology. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. I'm, I'm very glad to be here today among scholars, pupils, uh, colleagues from folk narrative, researchers of so many areas that have to do with, with Basile's writings. Um, I, I also want to say, as an introduction, my eyesight is just wretched, and consequently, my reading of the prepared of the of the talk I prepared will be at times halting, and I ask your indulgence because of that. Um, for for some years, I've been noticing the the presence, the overlap between Basili's stories and Basili's Pentamerone. Uh, the Quinto degli Quinti and uh, Ovid's Metamorphoses, and in and in, in approaching this this talk, I decided that although I would love to do an analysis of the entire corpus of Basile's tales, when I when I burrowed into the first tale that I that I encountered in the in the collection. The first day, second tale, I found so much to to focus on that I stopped there. And so this tale, this this talk, uh, has to do with La Mortella. Now, um, each of each of uh, Giambattista Basili's fifty tales has three important elements. The first is Basili, the storyteller. Uh, as an adolescent boy, like hundreds or thousands of aspiring courtiers or bureaucrats, Basile had learned Latin uh, as a schoolboy, very likely in a group with other adolescent boys. And this is this is an important uh, fact, <laughs> uh, which has already been alluded to. The second element in Basile's tales is the audience uh, for whose amusement he composed his tales. They too had learned Latin, probably from the same or similar Latin school books. They had the audience members had a similar education, upbringing, knowledge, uh, and uh, participation in Neapolitan Baroque culture. Basili thus shared a common, commonly studied and well known literary corpus with the audiences for whom he performed his stories, and you'll notice my use of the word performance, which uh, also ties in with uh, an earlier reference to Basili as performer. My reading of Basili's stories indicates that 
he was conscious of this, of this shared awareness, and that he manipulated this shared literary awareness to create ongoing interest, surprise, and humor in many of his sto- of the stories in the Pentamerone. There is also a third element, and it is the tale material from which Basili crafted his stories. Celebrated scholars like, uh, <laughs> sorry, I've lost my, I lost a word, uh, like Benedetto Croce, N. M. Penser and Michele Rock have richly annotated Basili's stories, identifying their sources and clarifying obscure references. One important but seldom mentioned source is the Metamorphoses of uh, of the Roman author Ovid. Exploring these three elements indicates Basili's storytelling methods, the story plots he chose, the words he chose to tell these stories, and his insertions of dramatic um, impromptu speeches into the storytelling. To make my argument, I've chosen not to analyze Basili's story category by category, because that would require you uh, here today to have a close knowledge of all the stories being analyzed. A better way to communicate the complexity of Basili's storytelling, I think, is to accompany him through the telling of a single story. This method situates all of us in the same story hearing experience as Basili's first listeners in the 1620s. And let me just stop right here. Am, am I coming through clearly? Okay. And if anybody wants me to slow down or anything else, please just jump in and say so. Um, so we're, we're, we are being with the original hearers. That's my point. By that, I mean that we will encounter a Basili story in the same order in which his original listeners did, that is, as they heard the story's words and phrases, one after the other. The story in question is an early one in the Metamorone, the first day's second story. Its title, La Mortella, in uh, Rack's, Michele Rack's bilingual Neapolitan and Italian edition, and The Myrtle. M-Y-R-T-L-E, Myrtle, in Nancy Canepa's English translation. Presenting the Myrtle serially in the order in which it is told, it was told, (laughs) allows us to uncover the dynamics of Basili's use of Greek mythology. His narrative strategies are allusion, manipulation and narrative chronology, reversing narrative chronology. A little detail, allusion. Basili alludes to Ovid's Daphne and Apollo story rather than identifying it outright. Manipulation. Basili knowingly manipulates the audience's perceptions of and expectations for each allusion he makes uh, each allusion to Daphne and Apollo that he makes. Narrative chronology. Basili carefully choreographs the order in which he presents uh, allusions to Daphne and Apollo in in the Myrtle. And he often and actually regularly reverses chronology. Identifying these compositional strategies at the beginning gives us here today an advantage over Basili's original listeners. Our foreknowledge prepares us to understand that the slow emergence of Ovid's Daphne and Apollo as a narrative underlay for Basili's Myrtle 
was a sophisticated compositional strategy on Basilius' part. Let us examine Basilius' myrtle tale in, in, de, in detail so that we can actually see Basili at work, word by word, phrase by phrase, and paragraph by paragraph. We will begin with Basili's thorough knowledge of Greek mythology as the Roman storyteller, uh, sorry, the Roman intellectual uh, Ovid published its stories in the Metamorphoses in the year 8 BCE. Basili's entire oeuvre showcases his fam familiarity with literature of the classic world. Little surprise there, since that knowledge was the necessary ticket into the 16th and 17th century world of court patronage all over Western Europe. That was particularly the case on the Italian peninsula. Ovid's Metamorphoses had long occupied a special place in Western European education. Its, its pagan stories had been Christianized and moralized for medieval Christian readers of the Latin language. And in this Christianized and moralized form, it had survived the Christian Middle Ages. Printing presses arrived on the scene in the mid 1400s, and with their advent, Ovidius Moralizatus, as it was titled, was effectively replaced by school book versions, Studiosi Lector, that, that started coming onto the market in international, regional, and local print centers. And in the same years, finally, the Metamorphoses started being published in the vernacular in Italian, French, German, and English as amusing reading. The Metamorphoses seemed to be everywhere that books were sold and Latin was studied. Let us turn now to Basili's composition and delivery of the Pentameroni, of the Pentameroni stories. The Pentameroni's uh, frame tale introduces and gets the, sets the stage for the collection's stories. Take, for instance, Basili's frame tale mention of Egeria. Few of today's readers know that Egeria wept so much at her husband's death that she was turned into a fountain that memorialized her excessive grief. Putting Egeria into the Pentameroni frame tale is, uh, of course, a perfect reference from Ovid's story, Egeria and Hippolytus in book 15 of the Metamorphoses, because it fits into the frame tale story of Zoses trying to fill an entire jug with tears in order to revive and marry Prince Tadeo. But the fact that the Egeria reference stems from Ovid's Metamorphoses goes unnoticed in all the annotations to the Pentameroni that I have read. Another frame tale allusion is Basile's description of a beautiful girl. Her eyes, quote, her eyes had insufficiently guarded the calf of her hopes. Am I still there? Whoops. Yes. Yeah. Am I there? Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. Lost, okay. Because I've I've lost I've lost a picture of you on my on oh. my screen. No, you're coming through clearly, Sue. Okay, then I'll then I'll keep on going. Um, that uh, most modern readers need help to understand this allusion to a calf. Nancy Canepa helps with a footnote referring um, Benedetto, re referencing Benedetto Croce's explanation that the calf is, quote, an allusion to the myth of Argus and the cow that was stolen from him by Mercury. A bit more detail is in order. 
because this was not an ordinary calf, but a, transfer, a transformed de demigoddess, the beautiful Io. And M. Penser, and M. Penser's 1932 annotation goes into greater detail, uh, citing Ovid's Metamorphoses, Book 1, Line 588. Penser's Ovid notation is important because Basili's calf reference is typical of his references to Greek mythology, nearly all of which are in the form in which they appear in Ovid's Metamorphoses. Of course, there are mythological references, other mythological references to each of these stories, but it is in the form they appear in Ovid's Metamorphoses that Basile renders most of them. Um, there is one from P uh, Plutarch, another from, but you get the idea. Um, alluding to this elite knowledge was one of the ways in which Basile could and did demonstrate his classical education to an identically classically educated audience an audience whose members probably laughed with satisfaction when they recognized Basili's reference in so unaccustomed a narrative uh, location. Such references continue uh, to appear, continue to appear often in the Pentamerone, beginning with the very first story, Il Racconto dell'Orco, in English, the tale of the ogre. Since Ovid's Metamorphoses recurs so frequently in, the, in this discussion of Basile's Pentamerone, let's turn our attention to Ovid's Daphne and Apollo, the story that I say underlies the myrtle. Daphne and Apollo is not only one of the earliest stories in Ovid's Metamorphoses, book one, story two, it is also the first Greek myth-based story in Basile's Pentamerone. In this, it, in this prominent position, it is one of the first, if not the very first story that 1500s and 1600s schoolboys learned in their study of Latin. Uh, as an aside, I remember it as, as uh, vividly from my own Latin studies uh, in the first year when we read Daphne and Apollo. I re even remember the picture of the fleeing Daphne. Here is the story as Ovid told it and as Basile and all his friends and, and acquaintances in his Neapolitan literary societies would also have learned and remembered it. Apollo after killing the great serpent Python, offends Cupid by, den by denigrating Cupid's arrows. Cupid strikes back. He wounds Apollo with one of his golden arrows, causing Apollo to fall irreparably in love with Daphne uh, and with every individual part of her body, her hair, eyes, lips, fingers, hands, arms, and upper arms. Apollo pursues Daphne. What he, can, what he can't see, he imagines. Daphne, whom Cupid has struck with one of his lead arrows, flees from Apollo. Lead, being struck with a lead arrow produces the opposite effect of what a gold arrow produces. Apollo gives up. Uh, imploring Daphne to love him and begins chasing her down just as a as a Gallic hunting dog runs down a fleeing hare, Ovid's words. Daphne begs her father that she may lose her figure because that so attracts Apollo. And the Latin text emphasizes emphasizing the relationship between Daphne's figure and Apollo's lust is twice repeated. Immediately, so the text continues, thin bark begins to cover her soft breasts. 
her arms become branches, her hair turns into foliage, and her feet turn into roots. Apollo can now catch her. At last, possessing her, Apollo declares her to be his tree, from which he further declares he will craft his lyre, will crown his own head and the heads of all triumphing Roman generals. Ovid concludes the story with Daphne's apparent acceptance of Apollo's reorientation from physical lust to symbolic reverence. When Basile used this story as the basis for his telling of the myrtle, his classically educated listeners may have recognized the presence of Ovid's story within it. And they could, in all likelihood, have delighted in the cleverness with which Basile inverted and reversed the original story. Here's Basile's telling of the myth, myth Myrtle story. Cheka, the, the fictional um, narrator of Basile's Myrtle, <clears throat> observes that men should flee a public woman, a prostitute, even more than they flee the sight of a serpent. Now, why did Basile throw in the word serpent in the, in the myrtle right at the beginning? Was it because Ovid wrote Python, the word Python, the person Python, the serpent Python, into the opening lines of his Daphne and Apollo? Python was the name of, of the serpent that Apollo slew at Delphi. Here we experience Basile's manipulation, uh, manipulating his audience. Because Ovid used the Latin word Python and Basile in his story used the Neapolitan word scorzone for snake, his initial listeners probably didn't immediately comprehend the equivalence between scorzone that is Basili's Scorzoni and Ovid's Python. But it was Basili's first move in building up to a moment when the penny dropped. Next, Basili gets the story going with a venerable folk narrative trope, a long childless couple in a nearby village. The wife longs so much to give birth that she says she'd be happy to give birth to a branch of myrtle. The word is mortella in both Neapolitan and Italian. Why myrtle? We ask. Ovid's Daphne and Apollo, in, in Ovid's Daphne and Apollo, Daphne turns into a laurel tree at the end. Te nostre lare, as Apollo addresses her. Laurels and myrtles are less closely related than python and scorzone and serpent. They differ significantly in size. Laurels, a laurel tree grows about 18 meters high, can, can do, while a myrtle shrub grows to a maximum height of five meters. In botanical terms, the two plants each belong to an altogether different genus. Once again, Basili is using vocabulary not to denote, but to connote a relationship between his little myrtle shrub and Ovid's great laurel tree. Now, back to Basili's myrtle story. After nine months, the wife's longing is satisfied and in Basile's words, the Elysian fields of her womb casts out a beautiful myrtle branch. The Elysian fields of her womb, calling a woman's womb the Elysian fields, turns this classic mythological location inside out. People don't get cast out of the Elysian fields to begin their lives as Basile here outlines 
the myrtle branches, the myrtle branches birth. Instead, the Elysian fields are their final resting place. The Elysian fields are in the Pentameroni story because it's another of Basile's beloved inversions. Now, back to Basile's story. The little myrtle branch's mother plants her in a decorated pot, tends her carefully. One day, the local prince sees the beautiful myrtle and demands it for himself. He has the plant delivered to the palace and he begins tending it. But one night, he hears footsteps nearing his bed. And soon he feels, quote, a little something that was more mellow and soft than Tunisian wool. The prince flings himself across the bed and believing her to be a fairy, wraps himself around her like an octopus and they make love. The mutuality of their passion is expressed by the grammatical verb form, a gerund, which vividly includes both participants, the prince and the fairy. This is not Daphne fleeing Apollo at all, but an inversion of that image. This image of a full, fully and willingly participating female also inverts uh, Ovid's story because in the Metamorphoses story, Daphne desperately flees Apollo's pursuit. We wonder if Basile's initial, uh, initial listeners recognized this inversion and were beginning to understand the joke in Basile's ongoing tale. After seven days of mutual love play, we're back in the story now, uh, in Basile's story, the prince wants to know who his bed partner is. So while she sleeps, he calls in a servant with a candle whose light shows her to be a superbly beautiful woman. This episode, of course, alludes to another classical tale, Apuleius's Cupid and Psyche. Still formulating his, his source story beyond easy recognition, Basile's ne next introduces an impromptu speech with paragraphs and paragraphs of Baroque exaggeration and extension. It's, it's far too much uh, for the heroine, all this talk, very fancy talk, who modestly brings the prose back to daily reality when she says that she's, for her part, willing to empty his chamber pot. Are you still hearing me? Oh my God. So you're coming through clear, sorry. Okay. Your, your camera has frozen, but we can hear you. Okay, <laughs> I'm glad because I've got a blank screen that's asking oh. me to sign in. <laughs> uh. Immediately after, after linking the beautiful fairy to this most humble task of emptying a chamber pot, Basile puts these words in puts these words in the into the myrtle heroine's mouth. Quote, I consider it a great fortune that from my myrtle from a myrtle branch plant in a clay pot, I, the, the fairy, have been transformed into a laurel bough. These words, laurel and transform, transformation, unequivocally link both the fairy and Basile's story with Ovid's Daphne and Apollo. Basile did not, however, use the word metamorphosis as Ovid did in his title, nor did he even specify the transformation as such. Instead, in his Neapolitan text, he had the fairy say that she had become a laurel bough. Nonetheless, 
the concept of metamorphosis together with the word laurel establishes another equivalence between his myrtle and Ovid's Daphne and Apollo. In this way, Basili prepared his audience for a straightforward continuation of Ovid's Daphne and Apollo with, within the myrtle tale he was telling. But Basili was adept at toying with his audience and their expectations. He had already shown this in the Myrtles in the Myrtle by reversing the chronology of the of Ovid's tale. By that I mean that Basili began his tale with a heroine as a plant, shrub, whereas Ovid's heroine became a plant, a tree, at the end of his story. So, having led his audience to expect more Ovidian material in the ongoing story, Basili surprises them again. He returns to the well-established medieval and early modern literary trope of extending a story by introducing a narrative impediment to the happiness that the prince and the willing fairy are about to achieve. Listen to the way in which Basili uses low humor to introduce Ovidian gore from other stories of the metamorphoses. How, how he gets a, a startling mix of fantastic fairy tale structure and gory Ovidian content. Here's what happens next. Into a thick layer of foreboding Baroque metaphor, Basili drops fatal information. The prince must go away for two or three nights. Basili covers this ominous fact with another thick layer of regretful Baroque rhetoric, which I'll spare you from hearing. Now, this great and virtuous prince has been keeping seven women of vice, prostitutes, whose field, Basili says, uh, the, whose fields the prince has recently ceased tilling. You'll recognize that uh, hallowed metaphor for sexual intercourse. To learn why he's lost interest in them, the women have a tunnel dug from their house to the prince's bedroom. Seeing the beautiful tree in its pot, each breaks off a branch. When the youngest of them makes the bell ring, uh, there's a bell that the prince has put in onto the, uh, onto the, the myrtle, laurel, uh, to alert the fairy to his re return home. Uh, the fairy thinks, the prince has returned, and she turns herself into her human form. It's worth reading Nancy Canepa's translation of the following se sentence. As you listen, imagine the verve and gusto with which ba Basili probably delivered the whore's angry words to the delicate fairy. You're the one who who draws the water of our hopes to your mill. You're the one who took from, from our hands the lovely scraps of the prince's grace. You're that madam magnificence who has taken possession of the tender flesh that belongs to us. If you get out of this one, then I wasn't born in nine months. Now comes the trademark Ovidian gore, which runs the gamut from oozing baby brains to disemboweled adults with entrails trailing behind them as they try to escape their pursuers. You don't have these images embedded in your, in your memories as you read, as you hear Basile's story, but every one of Basile's classically schooled listeners would have recognized Basile's words as newly reformulated embodiments of classical 
Ovidian prose. Basili moved the bloodiness of the attack into the salvational fairy tale section that follows. The prince's servant arrives to find the disastrous scene. Quote, he picked up the bits of flesh and bones that remained, and when he had scraped the blood off the floor, he piled everything back into the same pot, which he watered. We, a modern Chichester-based audience, realize exactly the same thing that Basile's 17th century Neapolitan audience did. At this point in Basile's story, regeneration as a former self replaces Ovidian transformation. And the Basile text is explicit. Quote, she materialized before Coco Marchione, that's the prince's real name, um, here I am, here I am, alive and beautiful in spite of the old, those old birds. After they broke my head open, did to my flesh what Typhon did to his poor brother. In Basile's Neapolitan cultural surroundings, we encounter much that recurs in the Myrtle and other Pentameroni stories. There was the intellectuality of literary societies whose members were like Basile himself, classically educated, uh, classically educated courtiers and bureaucrats. Those surroundings also included street performances that ranged from readings from printed texts to well-rehearsed or improvisational uh, puppet theater. Above all, street performances like in-house theatricals included impromptu speeches. Basile included those two uh, into, the, into the Myrtle as we've seen, and into the Pantameroni as a whole. Here's a typical example. Quote, but then the prince returned from the hunt and pulled the silk thread and rang the bell. That's the intro to the uh, thing. You'll remember, and Basili's audience would also have remembered, that ringing, ringing the bell summoned the fairy within the myrtle bush out into the real world. But what follows is an unambiguously performative Im impromptu speech that just riffs on ringing a bell. And Basile, the performer, now allows himself to, 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 to riff. Oh, bitter me, oh, desolate me, oh, miserable me, who has made me this this beard of tow, who has even, who has given me the low card in Triunfo, a card game? Oh, ruined, devastated, shattered prince. Oh, my branch, branchless myrtle. Oh, my fairy. Oh, my, <laughs> oh, my wretched life. Oh, my delight. You have gone up in smoke. Oh, my pleasures. You have gone sour. What will you do in, um, unlucky Cola Marchione, naming himself again. Um, whew, where, where's the bell ringing? Dear heaven, I raised it. Um, Basile's happy ending. Okay, be the bell ringing to which I introduced you. Um, Basile riffs on ringing the bell, look for the bishop, ringing the bell, maybe the quail will come uh, because bells were also uh, connected with, with um, uh, public public uh, processions and with hunting birds. Basile's happy ending in the Myrtle differs structurally from Straparola's, which always, Straparola's happy endings always occur in a rise or restoration tale's final statement. Instead, Basile's wedding 
the happy ending, we think, does not occur in the tale's ultimate uh, event, does not occur as the tale's ultimate event, but as something tucked quietly into a string of events, as one event among many. And in and in these words, with the ben- and in these words, here, here is the wedding. With the benevolent consent of his father, the prince married the fairy. This is followed by a banquet, by sentences for by sent oh <laughs> criminal sentences for whoever had had laid a hand on the fairy self condemnation by the seven hags and finally the execution of six of the seven hags by being quote buried alive inside a sewer pipe only then does the story's happy resolution begin we are left to conclude that these acts rather than the earlier wedding of the prince to the fairy, are the point of the story. And what are these acts? They are resolutions in the broader community for those people who contributed to the prince's wedding to the fairy. Quote, the youngest sister, of those whores, the ones who were executed, is given a good dowry and marries the prince's chamberlain, his camarieri. The Myrtle's mother and father receive a pension, enough to live on comfortably. Only after Basili resolves these accessory details of the story, does he declare a happy ending for the prince in six simple words. He lived happily with the fairy. But the wicked hags get the last narrative words, 11 of them. And the daughters of hell concluded their lives in bitter torment. The Myrtle tale ends in a way that at once Um, that is at once self-referential and culturally transcendent. The final phrase in the story locates Basile in the same space in which he told the body of the story, and the space is a place where he and others were playing a popular Baroque game. Give somebody, the game is, give somebody a proverb, and ask them to create a story which exemplifies that proverb. The tale he has just told, he says, quote, proved the truth of that proverb of the ancient sages. The language, the lame goat gets by if it finds no one who blocks it. This is, of course, nonsense. There is no such proverb of the ancient sages. And if there were, this story certainly would not prove it. It was Basile's final inversion in this story, and it must have been followed by a momentary stunned silence during which his listeners processed the humorous illogicality of Basile's ultimate literary trick, his undermining the very rules of the game of telling a story to exemplify a proverb. So from this limited study of one tale, I've I've drawn several conclusions. First, my work so far shows that Ovid's Metamorphoses were Basile's principal source. I know I only talked about one tale, but choosing this subject to work on was based on the recognition that you find Ovid's Metamorphoses in so many places in the Pentameroni. Um, Okay, first conclusion that the metamorphoses were Basile's principal source and uh, point of reference for the Greek myths which he alluded to in the Myrtle. 
Second, in the history of, of European fairy tales, fabulae and märchen, Basili's versions and reversals, inversions and reversals of Greek myth in the Myrtle set an entirely new direction. Three, Basili appears to have incorporated Greek myth from Ovid's Metamorphoses, not only into the Myrtle, but also into many tales in the Pentameroni. Four, Basili's manner of incorporating Greek myth into these tales confirms that he and his initial audiences shared a knowledge of the same classic antique sources, among which Ovid's Metamorphoses is dominant. Five, in the history of European fairy tales, fabulae, and märchen, Basili's use of Ovidian source material uh, creates new plots um, irrevocably influenced, new plots, comma, irrevocably influenced the further development of the genre itself. And finally, the content and structure of the Myrtle story points unequivocally towards Basili's having performed the story before his peers, probably in a meeting of one of the literary act academies to which he belonged. Now, I would like to say in conclusion that I've what I've presented here is the beginning, not, I think, of work that I will do, but that work that I hope will be done by, by other scholars con continuing um, uh, the, the study of Basili's manipulation of, of classic source material throughout the Pentamerone. And with that, I close. I'd love to see your faces, and I'm going to try to, to get, get back to you. Yeah, so, Sue, are you going to try and log out and log back in? What I should, is that what I should do? Well, if it's asking you to sign in, maybe that will help. I think so. Sorry. So we'll we'll wait. And um, if you go out and come back in, and in the meantime, people can put their hands up if they have any questions. Oh, there so, you are. Oh, there it worked. You. Okay. <laughs> I wonder what happened. How lovely to see you. Um. So, does anyone have any questions? Oh, sorry, Lorenza. It's your it's your turn, and I'm and my bossy boots that's taken over. <laughs> No, 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 absolutely, absolutely. I would have said the same. First of all, thank you very much, Professor Bottingheimer, for this splendid paper. Um, I don't have anything to ask uh, rather than <laughs> saying, yes, I agree with you. <laughs> That's a lovely response. I can't tell you how, how much <laughs> Yes, which brings us back to the literary yes, circles that he frequented and uh, ways in which Ovid, the concept of uh, imitation, imitatio, uh, also in relation to Giambattista Marino was very much at the core of uh, the debate. Uh, so thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yes, uh, Davut? Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Butikheimer. Uh, it was really, really uh, illuminating. Uh, just I wanted to add that um, in uh, Basile's tales, I encountered a lot that a man uh, marries a fairy. Okay, so this in many tales I, I saw this sentence. In the end, they marry, etc. Uh, just I wanted to add that in Persian tales, it is somehow forbidden that a man of flesh marries a fairy and but as it's, it is clear that in the stories it happens <laughs> so whenever they marry in the end it is misfortune in the end misfortune happens either the fairy uh, says that you should not marry me if you marry me you will be unhappy in the end so uh, either she leaves or somebody kills her uh, well I'm not sure why, but possibly because the word for fairy in Persian, it is pari. Mm. It is pari. And in before Islam, this wo the word comes from pari ika, 
in uh, pre, uh, let's say, in, in Pahlavi terms or in uh, uh, old Persian uh, stems, Pariika, which was a negative, like like uh, like a, an ogre, for instance, or like a div, we say in Persian. But later on in the course of centuries, it turns into a positive term. Okay, so when you say even now, uh, uh, many many girls are called Pari in Iran. Okay, the, the the name is used, so it is very very positive, especially it is used for beautiful girls, etc. etc. But it seems that in the stories, in Persian stories, I mean, there is a, still a reminiscence of that uh, negative stem from pre-Islam. That is why it is forbidden in Persian tales to marry a fairy. Um, th that's that's very very interesting. Uh, can, is, can you date the uh, the point in the development of of uh, Persian narrative in which the party takes on positive characteristics? Um, well, if you... It's, it's, it's not really easy to say a date because, let's say, nearly 2,000 years, years ago, nearly 2,000 or 1,800 years ago, we can say still we have the negative word, but uh, after nearly seven centuries, eight centuries, slowly and slowly we have the reminiscent of the positive thing, terms. But in order to um, say when, it's actually practically impossible because it's a course of centuries. Mm -hmm. um, but but you're but I think you're indicating that it happened uh, in within the early the early medieval period in Europe. It, parallel with that. Um, more or less, we can say some centuries, two or three centuries before or after that, more or less, yes. Because in medieval period in Europe, what we have, in Iran, we had 7th century in, in Hijri, Islamic Hijri. And so um, nearly 7th century, it means 700 years after the conquest of Iran by the Arabs. And if you go back by nearly 900 years, in 900 years before uh, European medieval period, okay, 900 years before that, still we have that negative, negative term. But after some centuries, slowly and slowly, it turns positive. Uh, I ask because because the um, because there 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 are to speak very broadly two kinds of tales with fairies in them in the European uh, fairy tale tradition. In one the fairy has comes from her own realm and can go back to her own realm and in and in those in the tales in which they fairies have their own realm it things go very badly for people who uh have to do with them and in uh shakespeare's midsummer night's dream for instance is a very, is a good ex and well known example of that in straparola's in in uh, Straparola's tale, I think the uh, Prince Pig, we have one of our first instances of a fairy who comes from nowhere and goes back to nowhere. And those fairies are, uh, so the fairies who, who, who don't narratively have um, a land of their own, those are the ones who turn into the good fairies who are, who, who benefit. Um, that the, they're the human they have anything to do with and it is um and and you see a very interesting instance instance of this in a tale which came which joined the arabian nights tradition uh in the 18th century uh one told by hannah diab and that tale is uh Prince Ahmed and, and, and Pari Banu. She has her own realm, but she also <clears throat> has a beneficent effect on her lover, of the, her human lover. And this is this represents something new and different. Now, this tale was told, this tale actually was based on a tale by Madame Dolnois interestingly enough. And so the teller, Hannah Diab, 
in 1709 was drawing on a different tradition from the one that people normally expect him to have been drawing on. And we get a fairy there with a, with a, her own fairy kingdom who doesn't you know, precipitate the human into, in, into uh, death and destruction. Anyway, it's a very provocative subject. We could talk. I, I wish I were there. We could go out for coffee and talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? I'd, I'd particularly be interested in, in pushback, things that people find unconvincing in this, in this line of thought. Nobody disagreeing. <laughs> All right, <Okay>. then. <laughs> well, thank you very much for for having this this wonderful wonderful conference. I, and I've just I've been learning a lot. So interesting. And, and the perspectives from so many different uh, scholarly, so many different scholarly perspectives and, and, and backgrounds. Just wonderful. Thank you very, very much. And thank you very much, uh, Professor Bottingheimer, uh, for your splendid paper, uh, from which we have learned a great deal too. <laughs>